everybody. Was everybody here last night? Almost everybody? I think everybody. Almost everybody. OK. Welcome back. I told you there'd be, there'd be day two. Um, so last night was really cool. If, I hope everybody had a good time. It was a lot easier, speaking to somebody on stage. Uh, a few people are kind of liquored up. So the bar is open back there. Uh, just putting that out. <laughs> um, also, j just a reminder, the sign over there says bookstore. So if you want to buy books from the people here today, uh, then follow the arrows. Uh, go buy your books and then bring them out to us to sign or to do whatever, rip the pages open, something. Um, so we're gonna, we have two of these conversations today that we're gonna dig into. Uh, we'll make uh, life really simple. We're gonna start off today talking about, well, I mean, we're here talking about drinks books, so we're gonna talk about some of the drinks, best drinks books uh, in history and contemporary and kind of delve into that. And we have two people that really, um, God, I have no idea how this is gonna work. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, we, we've got Noah Rothbaum, and Noah, uh, it's, it's, uh, Noah has been a long-time practitioner of the dark arts of, of drinks journalism. Uh, he's currently the uh, editor of Half Full for the Daily Beast and co-host of the Life Mind Bars podcast with David Wondrich, and also the author of The Art of American Whiskey, which he is signing over there. Uh, Noah. Thank you. Then we've got Jim Meehan. Jim is, you know, has an illustrious bartending career, best known for his work at Paul's Club in Madison, Wisconsin. That's true. Uh, <laughs> I was like, that's not what PDT stands for, but okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, and a few other things along the way. And also the author, of, most recently, of Mian's Bartender Manual, um, again, available at the bookstore and for signing with Jim. So with that said, we're here talking about books. Which ones should we care about and why? Well, I mean, to start off, I thought this was a... Like when Jim and I started talking about this, I thought this was a great idea, but mm -hmm. I didn't realize that all of our author friends would actually be in the Sitting same room. Sitting here staring right. at you. Wondering. And I was like, <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, it's like, oh shit, Jeff Barry's not <laughs> right. on the list. Fuck, fuck, <laughs> fuck, we gotta change the list now. Like, He's probably oh, gonna crap. be really disappointed. Oh, man. <laughs> like, it's like we're gonna have a car waiting outside that's all gassed up just to take us right <laughs> to the airport. So, uh, you know, we're ready. You're going on, you're getting on a flight right okay, after this. I've got, to, I've got to look at these people. <laughs> the if you have any complaints, see Jim. He'll be here until tomorrow. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, so. Uh, yeah, um, now I'm terrified of doing this, but uh. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the the one thing that I want to like sort of put out there, and I feel like it's the like there was some there's we we got into a, a, a tiny little bit of deep talk last mm -hmm. night and then we the smarter people in the room kind of mm -hmm. pushed that away, but I <laughs> since some of us are not yet blackout uh, mm -hmm. uh, infused, I would just say that to preface this sort of like top ten list, I mm -hmm. think that bias is a huge part of both what Noah and I are about to do, and since we didn't compare notes, we, we don't we know have, if there'll I be have any no idea here. what Jim has put down. No but I would say it. that mm -hmm. to preface this, like anytime someone writes a top 10 list, mm -hmm. you know, you have to consider like, who is the, like history is written by the victors. Mm -hmm. So who is the, what is the bias of the person who's creating the list? And implicitly, how does that list serve their interests? Mm -hmm. And so part of like mm -hmm. what I'm going to say, like we, when we were talking about this idea yeah. of like listing 10 books, mm -hmm. I just want to say these aren't my favorite books, although actually they are, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're not the best, they're not the top 10 best mm -hmm. books, mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily my top 10 favorite books. But we carefully Jim hasn't chose. even read all 10 of them. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> I, as you all know, I just look at the pictures anyway. I don't even know what books I'm about to announce. But uh, these I, are I what I, these, I was uh, like the most important books. Mm -hmm. So I feel like important okay. is an out. And I think that important, there are like many reasons why things are mm -hmm. important, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, you know, not necessarily because they contain the best drink recipes, right? Or that all of the drinks are wonderful or that you know we agree with the viewpoint of the author or but sometimes it's important you know for us i mean you're right i mean i'm i'm an editor and a writer and you know i'm i'm interested in things you know often because they're a snapshot of history right it's a real sample of what culture and society was doing at that time and i think looking at history through the lens of cocktails and food to a lesser degree is a fascinating topic and one that really is, I mean, much more interesting than reading a dry history book, but also one that really gives you a sense of what people were actually doing, you know, and really very mm -hmm. quickly. So I think a lot of the books, at least on my list, 
we're chosen because they give a snapshot of that, that, that they're important, not, not just because of the recipe. And I think, to be honest, most of us in this room, and it's, it's not what keeps us coming back and writing articles and books and talks is, I mean, it's, it's everything, you know, it's, there's the drinking of alcohol and there's everything else that makes it fascinating, right? I mean, you, you put the consumption to one side and mm -hmm. you have all this other stuff that, you know, that makes us come back and engages us. Right. Right. It's us just buying time before you guys start writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're going to have to uh, pick one and just start somewhere at some <laughs> point. So. Well, we did these chronologically both, so we'll start maybe with the oldest. And I imagine we're it's probably, probably on both. Of our we're lives. probably on both. So uh, I, Jerry Thomas. Jerry Thomas. I mean, you, you got to start with Jerry Thomas. I mean, the Bon Vivant's Companion or How to Mix Drinks, you know, published in 1862. I mean, he's larger than life. I mean, so much so that we're still talking about Jerry Thomas you know, 160 odd years later. I mean, you know, he had a, he was, I mean, at the time a real, you know, well known for his drinks, but also for the white rat that would, you know, sit on his shoulder, at least that's what Dave Wondrich has led me to believe. Um, his uh, gold mixing tools, his, you know, his gambling, his taking of, taking of bets, you know, he was a real, you know, force of nature running a bar below P.T. Bardom's museum at one point in Manhattan, so. Well, I feel like, uh, for me, 1862 Jerry Thomas is the first of the top mm -hmm. 10 most important books. And for me, it's simply because it is the first. And I think that for me, there are like, I picked milestone books on my top 10 list. And I think that it's just hard to be the first in anything. Mm -hmm. And I think the way in which that book codifies that, that bartending is a craft and these are the recipes and ingredients that you need to mm -hmm practice that craft and that, that the import of getting information out there is huge. And one thing I always point out to people about that 1862 book is like maybe a third of it is the Jerry Thomas part and the other like two thirds of it are the manufacturer for the mm -hmm. cordials and right. spirits and right. everything else that's in the back that people forget. But I, I just think that that book for the very reason of it being the first and for what it did to codify the, the, the trade was incredibly important. And obviously there are many other editions of it um, that came before it, but I thought 1862 was important because it was the trailblazing and, first. And I think you're right. I mean, what I was gonna bring up too, that his Jerry Thomas's original publisher, Dick and Fitzgerald, so believed in his book that they sandwiched it with somebody else's book, right? So it's like two books for the price of one. And it was sold like kind of like, you know, all these lists of like, you know, advice books and, you know, magic and, you know, weightlifting and all this crazy stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's very reminiscent of being a, a, a writer in 2019 that your book publisher thinks so much of your book that they have decided to publish it with somebody else's book to increase this audience. But, so. the, but the, I think the, what I would interpret that is, I mean, what some of you who like are, many of you who are actually authors, but for those of you here, for, the for those small of you who aren't authors who are, in the room, who aren't working this party here, uh, the, uh, or haven't brought your books to right, sell like, outside. The, the like dark truth of writing books is that like, the most qualified people don't write the books. The people who speak for yourself, Jim. Well, <laughs> yeah. Other, other than Noah um, and many of the, our other the, colleagues in this yeah, room, these guys are hacks too. Yeah. Um, the getting a book published. Jim's is gonna be here until like, Sunday. I'm just, I'm it's, be here all night. it's like the Spartan race where you have to write the oh. proposal and then you have to pitch it to the editor and the editor has to sell it to the marketing and sales team and the marketing and sales team says that it, like we don't want to give you 300 pages we oh. want to give you 200 and then you have to fight for 300 and then they say well Although, we'll have to print it on toilet paper if you want 300 right. pages and then <laughs> and then you have to be like all right well can you put a hard cover on the toilet paper and they're like no and, then you're sort of like, and it's just like it's so like the the politics of just getting something printed is so insane that most smart people are like, I'm not gonna write a book. Yeah. Like, I'll just, <laughs> that was I'll, crazy. I'll, I'll write a that? blog or like I'll self-publish. I would love or... to see those carrier pigeon messages between Jerry Thomas yeah. and his publisher, <laughs> like debating about, you know, so you know like I, on a quill pen, like yeah. Dude, Dick and Fitzgerald. I think <laughs> books are an interesting benchmark for mm -hmm. where we've come mm -hmm. because in addition to the quality of the content, these were people who built up a stature or who were like mm -hmm. deftly 
deft enough with the politics and business of the of the enterprise that they got their work out there. Right. And I think that is a measure, that's like a sort of measure of people's desire to get it out there. Right. And I mean, you know, the, the other thing with, with Jerry Thomas, yeah. obviously we, we go back to it because it's, it's you know, it is that milestone for so much, not only as, as drinks writers, but as bartenders of what we kind of, you know, it, it's like day one uh, in a way. It's, 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 it's the marker. But yeah. now that we have the safe one out of the way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, to be honest, I mean, I think we're still in fairly safe territory. Okay, right? but for do you, what, I, I imagine our second one is probably different. But what's your second one? I, 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 I want a little bit um, a book that we actually don't talk about in America, but we really should talk about quite a bit. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, Dave Wondrich, Dave Broom, Lou Bryson, myself, Nick Morgan, Dr. Nick Morgan, to talk down to Tales of the Cocktail about um, Alfred Barnard and his pioneering book, The Whiskey Distilleries of the United Kingdom which came out in 1887. That is a doorstop of a book. Um, basically what happens is, you know, we talk about a lot, Philuxor came, it was a terrible aphid, destroyed all of these vineyards, you know, cognac, you know, was wildly popular for cocktails and drinks, sherry, port, suddenly, you know, the supply is in jeopardy. People in London are thirsty, right? And they're like, hey, uh, up north in Scotland, we hear you make whiskey, like is it, good? Is it drinkable? So they, you know, this guy, Alfred Barnard, who was, you know, a journalist, um, also I think like, you know, weirdly he had done things like draperies or something, you know, mm -hmm. like all these different businesses. But he goes up there, he visits basically every distillery and writes a book. What I love about it is that there's almost nothing about how the whiskey tasted. Like for all, I mean, it's a book that's this thick. It has like almost no tasting notes. Mm -hmm. It's all about, you know, very, very, you know, measurements of stills, measurements of you know, distilleries, the line drawings, and it's, you know, he goes on to then write a few different pamphlets, The Art of Blending, another book about beers, but really it's the first major whiskey book that we have. Mm -hmm. And it is, I mean, it's an amazing resource and one of these things where a lot of brands or people write, oh, we have no idea what it was like. It's like, no, actually there's a whole mm -hmm. section that Barnard wrote about mm -hmm. this distillery, so. For me, Harry Johnson uh, uh, mm -hmm. was the my second book and mm -hmm. I feel like Jerry Thomas's 1862 book is about recipes for the mm -hmm. most part, for the ingredients and for the cocktails. And there's like a tiny little bit about bartending and, and how to do it. Whereas Harry Johnson's book is a book about bartending, mm -hmm. but, which does have a number of recipes in it uh, and some cool pictures for those of you who like the pictures. Um, <laughs> but it's a book about bartending and I love mm -hmm. how that book really kind of gets into like the importance of like cleaning the lamps on your tavern right. to sort of make sure that the people walking by will think that it's a reputable place to right. sort of drink in. And you remember like this is like right around the Food and Drug Act where right. like where what when someone mm -hmm. went and ate or drank in the wrong place, they might die afterwards. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I, I think I, that's one thing I really like about Harry Johnson. It does give you those kinds of snapshot glimpses into the time. You know, like, oh, this is how we got rid of fruit flies. OK, <laughs> you know, right. it's, a, you know, the endless problem that we deal with today. Right. This is how they were dealing with it then. Right. Uh, but it's, you know, it's like, you know, keep your nails clean. You know, the, 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 the basics of uh, a bartending of hospital hospitality and of running a place that uh, as you're getting to really kind of gives you an idea of what's going on in in the bar and in the larger world at that time. Yeah, and I think that it, we're in an interesting time now where like this craft cocktail mm -hmm. mixology uh, reenactment thing we've been doing for a while <laughs> is starting to actually, the, it's a consumer thing uh -huh. now, like it's popular, like, like mm -hmm. football players want to do it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that this all started with a geekiness about recipes and ingredients, mm -hmm. like in books like Ted Hayes, Vintage Spirits, and Forgotten Cocktails. Mm -hmm. We'll and get now, to that in a minute, Jim. Well, yeah. that, that didn't make my list, no. Oh, um, oh. And, but that being Ooh. said, now it's getting to a place where you start meeting even consumers and they want to talk about the like X's and O's of hosting a cocktail party and mm -hmm. not just the recipes, but like, how do I actually do this? Most of those people I find actually quote Jimmy Hans books. So, uh, <sighs> <laughs> All right, number three. All right, keep number going. three. Uh, um, I uh, similar lines. Um, uh, William Cocktail Boothby from mm -hmm. uh, San Francisco, uh, the world's drinks and how to mix them. You know, it's published a couple of times. You know, again, it's you know the whole Barbary Coast. You know, I mean, we the people in San Francisco like to throw around that term. Um, but we don't, as a whole, we don't talk a lot about it. Obviously, mm -hmm. Jerry Thomas spends a lot of time in San Francisco. Dave, for the Daily Beast, wrote 
pretty amazing story that sort of charts the history of San Francisco from like a muddy, like a mud patch with like, you know, a post office into a real city. And, you know, cocktails plays a huge part of that. And, you know, uh, you yeah. know, it's, an, I think, kind of an, I mean, we, somebody put out a reproduction a couple of years ago and Cocktail Kingdom does. Mm -hmm. But like, I think it's a real resource. And also some of them, I love the appendices in, in, in some of the editions where it's like how to make whiskey out of, you know, basically vodka and creosote and all this other yeah. crap that you never want <laughs> to get. And carrot peelings, yeah. Right, but like yeah. gives like a real window into, you know, what people are drinking. Mm -hmm. We did not compare notes, but okay. that is my third book too, oh, but for different God. reasons. Really? Okay. For different Woo! reasons. <clears throat> and I was thinking about it, and from what Dave uh -huh. has told us about uh, Harry Johnson and Jerry Thomas, it sounds like both of them spent a lot of time talking about Jerry Thomas and Harry Johnson. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like <laughs> a lot of the 19th century bartenders. Weirdly, nothing has changed with authors. Yeah. 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 Uh, All we do is talk about ourselves. Yeah. Um, awesome. But if you, if you look at. At least we have a precedent. Exactly. Uh, 1908, uh, and I'm sure there are previous editions, and I'm sure this wasn't the first, but if, if you look at books of that era, mm -hmm. This is where the corner turns, and like one of my biggest gripes and frustrations, which is why I, I write books the way I do now about our history, is like we don't know where a lot of the original techniques came from, or they're very hard to find uh, because they weren't well documented. Like, whereas I think that's one of the great services Punch Drink and, and what, what you guys are doing at Daily Beast is doing is like, who, who's the, where's the first dry shake? Who's the first, first person who like did? these specific modern techniques, and are they even modern, which mm -hmm. we later find out that they're not. But mm -hmm. I think that Boothby's book actually credits recipes and doesn't, and it credits recipes to other bartenders. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if you think about it, where the, the arc of where the like industry and the craft was, the idea that a, that a proud bartender mm -hmm. is writing a book and crediting other bartenders to mm -hmm. me leads me to believe that this is the f one of the or the original places where we begin to understand that this is a community of professionals mm -hmm. and that they're secure enough in their own talents that they can shout out a friend mm -hmm. overseas and, or at least say like hey I got this recipe this is where it came from right and I think like unfortunately that didn't become the standard like Craddock's mm -hmm. book we've found out is like been stolen, you know, all right. recipes were like stolen from everywhere else. But I think that like this presented a great example, I think, of how to write a cocktail mm -hmm. book, which is to like attribute where you got these ideas from and document it. Right. And I think, you know, like we were talking about last night uh, with uh, with Dave and Wayne in terms of, you know, tracing back sources and finding information yeah. and, and, and actually, you know, th things that point you in other directions. That's a good example of uh, now I have a better idea of rather just this recipe appeared in, in Bill Boothby's book. There's a little bit more information about that recipe. And I think and psychologically points in other this act of, of mm -hmm. willfully placing yourself within a community or a continuum or a tradition of bartenders. Like that mm -hmm. was a very mature authorial decision on Boothby's part, mm -hmm. which I think must have reflected a level of professionalism or in the trade, which was, it mm -hmm. was, must have been somewhat explicitly understood, or, or at least among really, some, that they're- Or they were really nasty. Yeah, I mean, it could, it could, it could have been like, an expectation yeah. you know, at that point, like, don't be a dick, put me yeah. in the right. book. You know, you're using my recipe, put me in there. I'd like to think that they had kind of banded yeah. together yeah. And, and they respected That's probably, each other. yeah, I just, I go there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Number four. He'd also been a politician, right? It was right. Big, like so. I mean, it seems very right. <laughs> political thing. To do. Yeah. Sure. Smart. Um, no, it's true. Um, number four. I mean, kind of a similar level we we're talking about. Um, and uh, I, I think Jim can actually critique this pick. Um, is the Hoffman okay. House Bartender's Guy by Charles uh, Mahoney? Uh, the modern. There's a modern edition that um, Jim wrote the forward for. So uh, I think he has to. Uh, I didn't pick it from my You didn't pick it, lesson. though. No. Oh, my God. You wrote, I, like, pages and pages about how it's so important. This is, like, the one book that you were, tr <laughs> like, tracking down for years, and it's not on your top ten I list? Are you kidding me? I just love the fact that Charles Mahoney was a bookie. And, right. And not just that, a bookie, like a, like, like a very that, successful bookie. That is like the he was fact that one of the tongue. greatest cocktail books of all time is written by one of the greatest bookies of all time is... Uh, but it's also amazing, like, again, it's like very specific advice, like mm -hmm. how to handle glassware, but also like why you should offer like free hot lunch and specifically 
crackers and cheese does not count as free <laughs> on lunch, you know, and like all like very, very specific advice. And I mean, and the history that you go into in your forward is really interesting just about like the Police Gazette was this sort of famous magazine and, you know, they published this book as well as their own mixology book and hosted all of these different cocktail competitions that sound very reminiscent of what we do today. And the Hoffman House has sort of largely been forgotten in New York and around the world, but was like the hotel. I mean, it was where everybody went. This is where everybody stayed. This was like, you know, all the influencers, all of the politicians, this is where you drank. There's amazing giant painting above the bar that's now at the Williams College and their art museum with these, you know, naked nymphs like dancing around, which is very skinless, but also brought a lot of people in, you know, for marketing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the book itself is, I mean, up until, I mean, we, you detail your search for it. I mean, really very few people had ever seen it. I mean, it was very important, but I think Gary Regan had a copy, you know. That was where I saw the first copy. And that's, yeah, and that's, mm -hmm. and that was about it. I mean, Greg, did he use your copy? I can't remember. I gave Greg my copy yeah. and then I found, quickly found another yeah. one. And then, and, um, and Audrey told me a crazy story that she Brother bought. Cleve found oh. one with the cover for mm. like, Eight dollars or something my, like my, that. My mother-in-law got one for three dollars yeah. in an estate sale and That's gave it to amazing. me for Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Well, Audrey found she put in Audrey Saunders, obviously from Pegu Club. I, she told me she posted on Twitter something in one of the mm -hmm. book sites. You know, you can put in. I'm looking for, mm -hmm. and like ten years ago, almost mm -hmm. to the day, she put in the Hoffman House, and somebody mm -hmm. emailed her and was like, oh, "I I see that you're looking for this, like twenty five dollars or something mm -hmm. nuts," and I was like. Open for trade dog trading. She was like, "No, <laughs> like, you can borrow it." For that. Yeah. But what, what is your? Uh, so it was. Four? I, they're like they're like I said. This is not my favorite books or or the best books. It's the most important books. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say my the book that I chose for my most fourth most important book mm -hmm. would be Barflies and Cocktails. Oh, okay, that is yep. a good one. All right, and that is a very I good one. chose I like Barflies that. and Cocktails because I think that it's the first. Cocktail, well, it's not, I'm sure it's not the first, but it's it's one mm -hmm. of the most explicit, tacit acknowledgments that bars are great, not just because of mm -hmm. the like nymphs and the bartenders and the recipes, mm -hmm. but because of the people who drink in <laughs> yeah. them. And it's like identity right. is identity yeah. is some measure of what you think of yourself uh -huh. and what others think of you. And I mm -hmm. think it was brilliant of Mac alone to, he, obviously there's a million ABCs and mixing cocktails mm -hmm. that came out in many years yeah. and it's like a mm -hmm. kind of awesome little pocket guy. It was like a whole book. society. I mean, yeah. we're talking about the bar in Paris, right? Harry's yeah. bar in, um, and you know, there was a whole group of people who drank there and they were called themselves bar flies. They, they had, had a club, and, a club and, then, and, and, and like they, one of the, you know, most people don't realize the Boulevardier wasn't created mm -hmm. by some fancy mixologist. Mm -hmm. It was created by one of the bar flies at right. Harry's, right. you know? And he smartly documents who yeah. it was and what he what he did and mm -hmm. and like and a little like it, it includes story. all these awesome illustrations. Mm -hmm. and like, I mean, it's it's almost like a you know the first graphic cocktail novel. You know, it's like you know it's, right. it's, it's that book. And well, I actually mm -hmm. like I collect um, these on things unfortunately, and that one was literally I think the hardest. Like getting a copy of that yeah. book was very hard, yeah. and it cost me a lot of money. Yeah, one thing I like about Barflies and Cocktails also is, I mean, we, we mentioned, you know, Jerry Thomas and Harry Johnson and Bill Boothby, yeah. and these are, they, they, but these are very kind of serious and straightforward yeah. and, you know, documentation, uh, presenting information. Barflies and Cocktails is fun. Yeah. It's yeah. just fun. And it, it, it kind of opens that door to, you know, like you say, to, to the culture of the bar. It's not just, you know, recipes and keeping the fruit flies mm -hmm. out and keeping your fingernails clean. This is this is a place where people come to have fun and enjoy themselves and see their friends. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, like, kind of at the beginning, as many of us in this room can attest to, like, 20 years ago when this mm -hmm. all started, like, a lot of the books we were writing at the time were for the other 20 people in this yeah. room. Right? <laughs> and, that, and that book definitely feels that way, too, right. that, like, uh -huh. like, who's, nobody, like, I mean, nobody's going to want to read this except for, like, our friends and family. Right. Like, I right. mean, maybe not even our family. So, you know, uh -huh. it's, like, yeah. kind of really inside baseball yeah. and jokes and uh -huh. funny commentaries and sides. And it's, like, but that's what makes it such a great, right. like, snapshot and historical. Yeah. Macalone you know. attributed recipes, yeah. too. And I think, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have, we have a great book about drinking in Paris during uh -huh. the 1920s in the audience, for uh, those of you who don't own it. But I feel like this was a really... Mm -hmm epic time mm -hmm. to drink in world history. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. this was like published in 1928 in Paris. So I just mm -hmm. feel like there are some rather epically delicious and interesting 
right. drinks in this book. It's, it's, it's fun and fascinating. Okay, number five. I mean, I, you've already maligned this one, but I do think the, the Savoy cocktail book mm -hmm. by Craddock Damn. comes out in 1930. <laughs> is that yours too? Or yep. I mean, uh. <laughs> I mean, it, it is really like an Art Deco masterpiece. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I had seen the book, you know, even before I really understood like be cocktails. I mean, it was the type of book that people wanted even when nobody cared about cocktails because it's so beautiful. I mean, as an art object, as a design object, mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, it, it's such a valuable piece, uh, you know, monetarily to all types of people, but has always been in demand. I mean, you know, I think Jerry Thomas is kind of interesting too. His book almost never goes out of print, right? There's always new edition, Herbert Ashbery, you know, is mm -hmm. that the guy who wrote Gangs of New York and, you know, almost constantly in publication. And the Savoy too, you see it's just right. countless editions of it. You know, it's printed in New York, it's printed in London first and all these other editions and, you know, not all of the drinks are great. You know, a lot of them are thoroughly unbalanced. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as, as, a, as a snapshot and historical kind of marker of where, you know, something that was so thoroughly American cocktails and thanks to prohibition and other forces sort of gets pushed out into the world and goes all around, you know, it's kind of, you know, Craddock, had, depending upon the research may or may not have worked at the Hoffman House for a while, but you, it's people taking this stuff and bringing it to Europe and, and going around you know Europe and, and teaching other people mm -hmm. cocktails. So this may go over like a lead balloon in a room full of actually real writers who uh, um, who. But are, why stop are, now? Why but stop, why stop <laughs> now? With that, with that um, preamble. I honestly think that this book, sir, is very important for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One. And it's not the first house cocktail book, but the from a, it's a time capsule mm. of a of a place in time, and it's a beautiful time capsule. Yeah. And I think mm. that, um, I'll never forget. Like as a writer, my brother, my parents live in rural Michigan, and my brother, who's a real writer, um, was disparaging my parents for not cooking the Korean recipes mm. from his Momofuku cookbook. Mm. Um, my parents don't even have a grocery <laughs> store in their town anymore. Right. And it just occurred to me, like, as a writer and having gone through the throes of just trying mm -hmm. to get a book published, like, if you guys want to burn my book for warmth or <laughs> use it as a doorstop or... I made it big. Whatever, so. like, you could use it. <laughs> if you want to, like, attack intruders with it, right. you know, like, I don't... It's like, I have a very, like... Right. Petrus and Coke thing, mm -hmm. like do whatever you want with it. It's yours mm -hmm. now. Like, mm -hmm. like I love it if you read it and thought about it, but it's a consumer packaged uh, good, and I right. hope you enjoy it. Like, yeah. <laughs> you, like you think Harry Craddock intended us for the? Like, I mean, burn whatever. So I, I just think that the fact that like the the publisher, like it's a beautiful object, right. and getting right. someone to make something that beautiful is right. is an is an important feat. Mm -hmm. And I think the. I think some of the great books are have sort of a time capsule purpose, and I do agree that it's a deco masterpiece. And it's sort of like the, that 1930 was when sort of things started going, mm. like the wars, and uh, there are a lot of things right. happened, and, and the sort yeah. of craft t tailed after that. So I feel like it was the sum total of like mm -hmm. 50 years of awesomeness right. uh, from a recipe capsule collection. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the one, the last thing I'll say is that I think it also served a, a, a purpose for all of us in this room where for so long there were no new cocktail books mm -hmm. and like the ones that were being put out were really terrible. They were like a thousand and one cocktails right. that you need to know. And like as writers, you could always at least say like at the beginning of this, I want to do something like the Savoy cocktail book or, mm -hmm. you know, like it was something that people still knew and respected mm -hmm. where right. so many of the other books that we're talking about now. It was the or, template for my first book. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it literally, you know, it's it was the one last book mm -hmm. that survived. Like, And know, the bar the is ages. still open. Right. And it's, it's just, just so hard amazing. to keep yeah. the bar open for 100 years. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're up into the 1930s. Number six. Number six. Well, I mean, kind of the opposite um, of what we're talking about is I think the old Mr. Boston has to be there from 1935. <laughs> it has to be. I mean, it's, that is, that's, the, you know, that it's, it's in, I mean, Jim also, 
if you remember, was an editor of several of them. I tried to cut them, as many right? recipes as I could. Right? I mean, how many, <laughs> old, how many old Mr. Boston's did you edit? Um, I don't want to hear it. But I mean, as just a, it's not maybe the best book, but as a cocktail book is serving to popularize cocktails, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that there's any book that's more powerful than any. As a bartender of the 90s, too, it was yeah. in every bar. Every bar. It was the telephone book. I in, mean, it's, in, it's every, every estate bar. sale, every mm -hmm. eBay. I mean, it's, there are, I don't know how many thousands of the old mm -hmm. Mr. Boston's are out there, but as a tool to get cocktails into the mass culture, I don't think that there are many other books. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's fascinating, a couple of years ago, Sazerac, you know, acquired, you know, the old Mr. Boss, mm -hmm. and they went through all of the editions that they could find, which are many, many, mm -hmm. and they put together an amazing website where you can see, put in like Manhattan, and how it changes from 1935 mm -hmm. to the modern era through every decade, how drinks change and morph, and mm -hmm. is that, I mean, there are a few other books, I mean, it's almost like our constitution, it's mm -hmm. like a living, breathing, Thing old yeah. Mr. Ball says it changes with drink trends. And Thankfully, the Constitution can't change that. <laughs> <laughs> All our interpretation. It, 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 it is like the phone book in that yeah. way, where you can go year by year and see you know these kind of micro changes that uh, exactly. you know, between 1935 and 1936 may not be that huge, but right. between 1935 and 1985, wow, the, right. a lot of things or have it's, happened. It's a little yeah. creep over you yeah. know 70 years that suddenly the Manhattan you know is. Mm -hmm being made with cotton. <laughs> and again, that's not, I mean, their whole purpose was collecting recipes. It wasn't mm -hmm. to create yeah. recipes. I mean, was, yeah. So post-prohibition, you don't mm -hmm. see cocktail books written as much by bartenders anymore. You see them mm -hmm. written by bon vivants and mm -hmm. drinks writers and, and sort of people about town. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that probably had to do with the where, where the craft went after prohibition, but I think also it had to do with this whole Herculean task mm -hmm. of getting a book published. And I would say for me, the my favorite of this genre of books is Charles H. Baker's mm -hmm. Gentleman's Companion. And to me, this is uh, the sort of zenith of mm -hmm. great bon vivant mm -hmm. drinks writing. He's such an excellent writer, and his stories are so awesome, intoxicating. Yeah. And you just read it even today, and you're like, Man, I wish I could spend yeah. one night drinking with this guy. Exactly, and, you know, the, it, and, and the recipes with, are cool. The, the, yeah, the, they're cool. <laughs> but but yeah, and it, the thing I like about Baker, and that I keep going to about Baker, is it's you know the, the drink is almost beside the point. Yeah. It's like oh, you totally. know, sip this drink and behold the world. Why, uh, why right. let a good now I'm in Egypt. And yeah, now exactly. I'm here and you're and, just and like, some of the and like some of the recipes will be you know you read it and like. Dude, that that's a hot toddy. You know, right. it's 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 water and whiskey. Well, I let a but you're on this boat, and story, like, exactly. yeah, right. exactly. Uh, and I think you know, for for those of us in the room who, who, who are not coming at it from the bartender angle, but from the there's a damn good story in here, or we can make a damn just, good story in here. It's beautifully written. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's just it's. Although it's the type of book that like I think people read and they're like, I want to write like this. And it's like don't. Yeah, like, please there's don't. There's not. This is a textbook. <laughs> Like yeah. he got he yeah. got away with it. This is right. not. Um, yeah, you can't repeat. You but can't again, repeat I mean, that. it's you know he's most famous for like a two part volume. Uh -huh. You know, um, and you know his own life is really interesting. Um, um, Sing Jin Frizzell mm -hmm. in New York has, has mm -hmm. done uh, wrote an interesting forward to mm -hmm. I think the South American um, version of Baker's book and, and you know has met yeah. with his daughter and. There's not, I mean, I wanted to do a seminar once with mm -hmm. um, Philip Green and, and Sinjin mm -hmm. about Hemingway and Baker, and mm -hmm. I had, they'd both written for Esquire, and there's a photo of them together that, that I think you had, that Phil had mm -hmm. given to me, and, but beyond that, there's not a lot else. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, so I, I, like I think I one of the other things this. about Baker, yeah. the you know, just kind of like the, ling, the the lasting influence is where you see entire bar programs that have kind of sprung from that, yeah. like you know, the uh, the the limit to Heaven's Dog, which is no longer there in San Francisco. Oh, yeah, yeah. Their opening menu was entirely yeah. interpretations of Baker drinks. Uh, California Gold, which just opened what two weeks ago uh, in uh, San Rafael. The, these these that's a Baker is the is the template for his menu. Well, and if you you go to Fort Defiance in Brooklyn, yeah. St. John's Bar. He, his baker's daughter gave Singjin one of his cocktail shakers. Mm -hmm. So he had this baker shaker night when he got it, and we all made drinks in it, which is pretty cool to mm -hmm. get a drink yeah. out of Charles H. Baker's own cocktail shaker. Right. And then it's like in a case on the wall, mm -hmm. so at least you can go and, and right. see it. Right. And survive Surking 
Sandy right. too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's let's move it a little bit faster clip because we're 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 going well, along. We're, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump huh? several decades. Huh? Um, you know, it, I think the problem is the sort of second half of this gets hard because there's so many books that uh -huh. come out. Some people might like, be alive. You know, and might be mad um, at you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, I jump all the way to '91 to the Bartender's Bible by Gary Regan. Okay. I mean, you know, it's one of these books that, like, in the dark ages, like. You know, it did have a thousand and one recipes, so it checked that box, but it also had, you know, you wanted to know what, you know, scotch was or bourbon. There was a mm -hmm. section on that, there was information. It was, you know, that awesome spiral bound, you know, book inside of like a hardcover. And I mean, it was an amazing reference. I remember using it, you know, 20 years ago as, as a young writer. I stick to the, the deep past, and it's, it may be controversial now because some weird racist comments mm -hmm. have come out recently in his writings, but uh, David Embury's Fine Art oh. of Mixing Drinks mm -hmm. remains, uh, I think, a mostly not looking at Embury the person, but just the idea of a theoretical book about mm -hmm. mixing drinks written not by a bartender, but by a lawyer who made mm -hmm. drinks at home. And his palate was you know, way too dry and way too strong, and... There are issues with the book, but I think going back to the importance of audience, you know, with books like Barflies, mm -hmm. it was a, a book that memorialized the the integral yeah. importance of mm -hmm. the of the people who drink in the bar mm -hmm. to the bar's identity. I think with the fine art of mixing drinks, the I think that they're in some ways a, a theoretical book about mixing drinks written by an outsider makes more sense because they don't they, they don't necessarily understand mm -hmm. things maybe as intrinsically as someone who does it for a living. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, a, and it's just an important book that has like been instrumental to people like Audrey and Dick Bradsell and, and yeah. people who are why we're here today. Right, and, and, and as cocktail enthusiasts, for, for, for those not inside the industry, it's, it's almost, you know, it's accessible in a way. Yeah. Uh, because this is, this well, is someone... It was sold like in a big book club, like yeah. the, you know, or whatever, Random House's book club of the mm -hmm. month. Like it was, I mean, I, if we had done this a few years ago, I probably mm -hmm. would have that would have been on my yeah, list for but sure, right? Yeah, he just right? had some yeah. like but like, news well, about But I mean, like out. Wayne Curtis, who's in the audience, wrote a story for me, I guess last year or year before, about Embry and, you know, and like, I mean, it's, it's beyond comments. I mean, he was, you mm -hmm. know, he was a lawyer and it goes into the segregation of like um, fraternities, which he mm -hmm. was very against. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I mean, it's a really, I mean, I would suggest you read Wayne's story. I mean, it's, it's a history, though, that really makes me not want to read his book anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unfortunate. I just, uh, you know, I can't. Personally, I can't bring myself to, to read it anymore. Right. It's just, it's right. such a, he was seemingly such a terrible human <laughs> being that, um, you know, I mean, I own a couple of copies of the one of the editions, and it's, it's like, I don't know what to do with them. Yeah, yeah. I think that it, I, like, uh -huh. I wonder how we'll look at Mario Batali years from now. I mean, I just feel like in some ways, mm -hmm. obviously, what he's done is awful. But I mm -hmm. think that in some ways, I think that one of we're in the we're in the hot mix mm -hmm. of a massive cultural reckoning where mm -hmm. people are looking for the the people have to be held accountable and things mm -hmm. need to change. But mm -hmm. I think that. Um, It'll be interesting when we're not in the mix of like when post reckoning, mm -hmm. if if climate change doesn't destroy our world before then, um, what we'll think again mm -hmm. when we're we're not in the mix of it. Right, right. So that's a pick that is a non okay. hot non hot take, but pretty hot because of it. Number eight. I think we got to go with um, the craft of the cocktail, Dale de Graff's book. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was such a pioneering book. Um, I, I think it's hard for us in 2019. To be, you know, you know, an American brandy distiller that looks like this and like mm -hmm. a thriving Louisville, you know, with all these amazing bars and restaurants and distilleries and stores and attractions to just realize how far we've come in 20 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an unbelievable path. And when Dale wrote that book, I remember what was on the bookstore shelves. If you went to Barnes and Noble and there are five books, six mm -hmm. books, most of them completely out of date and mm -hmm. terrible. Um, you know, and then you had you know, people like Gary Regan who were trying to somehow convince publishers to, to publish stuff. I mean, Dale's book was so revolutionary mm -hmm. at the time. I remember going to a, a book party for it and um, at a, it was like a, it was a crazy weird like health restaurant 
of sorts at like Rockefeller Center and, you know, it was like, you know, heartbeat or something. And it was an amazing part, but it was the type of thing where the industry was so small, like Audrey is, you know, bar backing, bartending, basically anybody and everybody who cared about cocktails, you could fit into one room. That was probably the size of this room. Mm -hmm. And I just thought to myself, well, I mean, I hope this is yeah. <laughs> like, I, I hope people really value this book as much as right. I do. But, and, and that was the type of thing as a writer, I would turn to that book over, I mean, my copy is dog ear, you know, mm -hmm. and I'd call Dale and say, hey, Dale, like, you know, because there weren't that many other sources. Mm -hmm. I mean, there weren't that many other people you could call right. and say, I need a quote about like. Who would answer the phone? Right, or just, <laughs> yeah. or just that I could find, like, hey, right. Dale, why is Irish whiskey, you know, like, what, how's it different than scotch? Like, right. you tell right. me. And it's like, yeah, here it is, and it'd be in the book. And, and that's, right. you know, such a landmark thing. And, okay. and the recipes are wonderful. And, right. You know, this gets to the painful stage where everyone's alive. Okay. We're, we're mostly alive. But um, <laughs> oh, I would God. say that um, for me, it was hard to not choose Crash the Cocktail or uh -huh. Ted Hay or Joy Mixology. <laughs> and not to pander to um, Mr. Wondrich, but uh -huh. uh, the I think Imbibe is uh -huh. one it's of on my, my top list, ten. Yeah. And, and I think that it's one of my top ten um, because it's sort of like the Rosetta Stone of... Like, for instance, mm -hmm. the old, like, Gary, Ted, and Dale gave us the old recipes yeah. and, and a wish list of, man, I wish these things were around, but they weren't around. But mm -hmm. Imbibe, the first edition mm -hmm. of the book, says, well, this isn't around, but if you mix, like, gin and Irish whiskey yeah. and a little bit of, <laughs> like, wine yeah. in it, right. it'll taste like that. Yeah. And I think yeah. that, like, the, <laughs> literally, like, yeah. the, first, <laughs> the first edition of Imbibe he had to like MacGyver, right. he MacGyvered the recipes right. of like not being like, man, I wish Creme de Ville had existed. He like actually right. like- Okay, here's where we go. Crazy, yeah. like cooked it up in like right. like meth or something in his mix, mm. in his lab. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I think this I will taste like chapter, a drink right. from right. 1870. Yeah. And I think that right. was a, I think that if we think about these, like especially the old history, mm -hmm. yeah. the the, it's one thing to sort of say like this happened, but mm -hmm. I think that the what the work of the writer of the mm -hmm. historian is, is to contextualize mm -hmm. history. History yeah. in and of itself is just data. Someone being able to take the data and mm -hmm. process the data for modern people to, mm -hmm. to wrap their head around is very hard. And I think that yeah. the first edition of Imbibe is the Rosetta Stone that allowed us to begin interpreting those old texts with some sense of clarity. And, and mm -hmm. I think yeah. back at like, all the champagne recipes in, in the 1862 Jerry Thomas. And it's like, Kermit Lynch wasn't importing that champagne. Mm -hmm. Like that wasn't coming over in a like right. temperature controlled uh, mm -hmm. container. Like right. that might've gone on the Oregon trail, you yeah. know? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> it might've been champagne when it left right. France. Yeah. By the time I got to Jerry Thomas, <laughs> it was like Most natural wine. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? So I, I just think that like, I never thought of it like that yeah. until Imbibe where like Dave yeah. actually thought about like what right. happened. Right. I mean, I'll do, I'll do a combined nine and 10 since. Huh. You stole my 10. Um, I mean, I have Ted Hayes' book, you know, Vintage Cocktail, was it? Vintage Cocktail Recipes, Virginia Spirits and Forgotten Cocktails. I mean, we're sort of represented like stage one where, you know, starting with people like Dale, like mm -hmm. we're, you know, and, and a bunch of random kind mm -hmm. of collectors who could have easily been mm -hmm. collecting postage stamps or, mm -hmm. you know, symbols or whatever, decided to collect cocktail books. And this idea where, you know, stage one was like assembling collections of cocktail books, yeah. right? mining these books for drink recipes and then like starting to make drinks again right and then mm -hmm. stage two was kind of like you know starting with dave was kind of the courage to say yeah i made these drinks and some of them are really terrible you know <laughs> and that was a thing because yeah. i remember going to like the bars in the early 2000s and you know drinks would come out and you'd be like i don't what? Can what? I say what I don't like this? You know, or you know, or you know, the aviation would come yeah. out, but we didn't have the creme vet or whatever. Right. And it was really weird, and yeah. and you know, and it wasn't cool to be like I don't I don't think Harry Craddock like this like everything right. that was in these books was gold, right? Right, right? So you couldn't say this sucked. And Dave was kind of like, yeah, I went through. Mm -hmm. Some of them really need to be mm -hmm. updated and changed, like depending upon products or uh -huh. palettes or measurements like you know figuring out what a glass was versus you know and, and a lot of people kind of didn't so you'd get a drink that was you know three ounces of 
maraschino liqueur and you know uh, maraschino <laughs> and you know like a dash of bitters and this thing you're like oh this is disgusting and like right. well it came from right and you're like well i okay right. i'll, I'll yeah. just drink it and be quiet and i think <laughs> but i think you know imbibe really allow yeah. people to say look like we have to like look at these things right. as you know we have to test them we have to try them we have to update them and there's nothing wrong with that and yeah that, you know maybe some it, of them don't work it, it opened the door you yeah. know it, it, it both contextualized it but also said you know what it's not the bible you know it's yeah. we, we, this is a starting point we can go from here and you started to mention uh we're getting out of order but we'll just go there ted hayes, ted yeah. hayes book yeah and i mean i think that was one of these things again where mm. that's sort of the bedrock of the, the rebirth of the cocktail where so many i mean ted hay is sort of you know and a lot of those people from the drink boy message board like you know have less and less of an influence today but like really that was it i mean that was the whole i mean that we all mm -hmm. kind of that's the primordial message board that all of this yeah. grew out of I and it, it I, the thing i like about ted's book is it was you know he he put in some of the batshit crazy recipes oh yeah uh that you know like what the hell <laughs> and he goes no 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 this is why you need to know this recipe, right. and it you know it's not necessarily because it's a it's a great drink. Some of them were definitely not great right. drinks, but it's the kind of story and it's the kind of uh, introduction to exactly. certain products, to certain spirits that you never come across, yeah. but like planted that seed of curiosity. Um, and made it interesting. I mean, made it like yeah. like proof to people who were like then drinking Cape Codders and mm -hmm. like. I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. woohoo's and you know, but, and then all of a sudden you hand him an Alma Guzlam, you know, right? And, the, uh, you know, and, and and really kind of saying here, look, like drinking is two parts. It's what's in the glass, but it's also the stories mm -hmm. and the lore and the history and all this other fascinating stuff. And that's what makes what's in the glass even taste better. Right. And I think Ted was one of the first people to say, "I'm like a you know a good rock and tour. Like I'm going to mm -hmm. tell the stories that maybe people knew before, but now." Mm -hmm. You know they don't like right right All my right. last two uh -huh. i think will are self-indulgent and okay. would probably create it's the pdt cocktail book <laughs> <Frustration. Yeah. laughs> and me and Zmanuel. Uh, they're both available <laughs> over there oh. available in the back i i have personally like made one of my sort of career missions like i remember dale talking about how jazz and baseball and cocktails were mm -hmm the like original contributions, like they're American things. Mm -hmm. And cocktails in particular are, are one of our, our culinary arts. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like for me, liquid intelligence is a coup for the bar world because we got the chief kind of food tech guy from mm -hmm. the French Culinary Institute to come not to food, but to come to drinks. And I became a bartender because I couldn't pass my science classes and become a medical mm -hmm. doctor. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that I'm grateful to like Dave and Wayne and Jeff and all the like drinks historians, mm -hmm. Robert for writing these books. Like I always used to joke, like, you know, like one of the reasons I had to become a teacher is because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life mm -hmm. in the library. Like I don't mm -hmm. love being in the library. Sure. I love being in a bar. Mm -hmm. um, I think Dave d did the research and we have, some, we, have, we have a beginning text to work with from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think that liquid intelligence Dave is- Dave Arnold. Dave Arnold. Dave, we've actually yeah. said his name. So. Um, <laughs> is it, one of the 10 mm -hmm. most, of my most okay. important books. Is that a dog or an animal? I think it's, <laughs> I think it's Fred's son. Um, <laughs> exactly, yeah. it's amazing. His favorite too. And then, and huh? then my 10th- Sure, did you, yeah, did you I, I already tenth? went, yeah, yeah. I, went. I did. And this is also probably going to like push some hair back. But for those of you who write books and maybe occasionally that. Google or check their, where they're at on Amazon, I think that the, the book that has changed our, the industry mm -hmm. the most to this day is the Death & Co. book. And I mm -hmm. think that they sold that book for mm -hmm. uh, the sort of amount of money that a top chef would pay mm -hmm. to sell their book. And they've actually sold through their advance. And, and if you like, if you go to the Amazon, if you go to cocktail Amazon and put cocktail book in, Mitty Hemlich's ultimate bar book is usually in the top ten. And then it's like a mixture of like Tequila Mockingbird, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. there's like. Which to be honest, that guy is the best-selling cocktail book it, author of all time. It, almost it, like I mean, his books. I remember when millions. when I. Pitched the PDT cocktail book in 2009, 
you couldn't like the most serious drinks book out there mm -hmm. by a bartender was like the employees only book, mm -hmm. which was a coffee table book. Mm -hmm. And I feel like whether you think it's the greatest book of our time or not, the Death and Co book is it, it's a thoroughly professional book mm -hmm. cataloging the recipe, like all of the recipes at the time of one of the most important modern craft cocktail bars. And it, I think that it like picks up on a lot of great uh, other books. Like they have some of their 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 favorite guests in there. The illustrations are beautiful. The it's just a it's a it it's not only a, I think a great cocktail book, mm -hmm. but it's a book that trailblazed for the rest of us to be able to to put out professional cocktail books again. Mm -hmm. And I think that going back to what I was mentioning before about pre-prohibition, most of the cocktail books or bar books were written by bartenders post prohibition all of the drinks were mostly written mm -hmm. by drinks writers or bon vivants or people who covered drinks for newspapers or magazines and i think that like the death and co book really sort of created an opportunity mm -hmm. for um, for bartenders to to have an, a platform and an audience to begin writing again mm -hmm. and and while while we're not um, as great a writers as um, many of you guys out here um, I think that there's something to be said for hammering away at it mm -hmm. anyway, because you're talking about what you do as if something being filtered through a lens of interpretation by a better writer. Right. The one caveat I would say is that Nick Foshold is a professional writer. <laughs> so, I mean, right. but, I mean yeah. it's two bartend and, you know, right. and a professional writer. But, um, did I we do, skip over your no, number no, nine? I, no, I, I did two in one. So. Okay, all right, so you got it. I, and I do love that Death & Co. I think it's I think it's the Death & Co. book and not the second Death & Co. book. Mm -hmm. The first one starts with a pretty rambling forward from Toby Cuccini, mm -hmm. yeah. which is, uh, I think, pretty hilarious. That This best-selling starts with this like crazy email that he wrote to them in the middle of the night or something that they thought was <laughs> so amazing that they decided to make it the forward. I can only imagine like people who buy that book uh, like who have no idea who the hell Toby is, <laughs> being like, "What does any of this mean, and why is this the forward?" But, right. Yeah. So, before we before we take some questions from the crowd, um, we started off saying, you know, how one of the cool things about you know important books is it gives you some kind of snapshot of a time, like what what the drinking culture, what bar culture, what cocktails yeah. were like at a certain point when that book was written. So. When they do book stock number 50 or number 100, <laughs> 100 years from now, and people are trying to get a grasp and on these books what, are still what, what does it look like? You guys have to have a huge riot now so that they won't yeah. have this. Next <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, the mud pit is outside. Yeah. Um, what, for early 21st century, pick one. They'd like say, okay, this will give you an idea of this what things are This is why I didn't like. want Paul to moderate right here. Oh. Um, <laughs> that's a really hard question. You want me to think? Like well, we just did. One. I just picked two books from right. the 21st century. Right. Sure. And and you and so you would say those would fit the bill for for like you know the the drink historians from 100 years from now, 50 years from now. What, what was it like? About our in, like about our drinking culture today. About right now. Yeah. Wow. Honestly, I mean, I think that it depends on what. Mm -hmm. Going back to this idea of like mm -hmm. who writes the history mm -hmm. and what does it serve. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the it's fascinating. Like I think. Shannon Mustafa mm -hmm. wrote a tiki cocktail book this mm -hmm. year. She is the first, I mean, Doug Ankara of Lab Bar put out a, a book that they, I remember that was the first night I met Jamie Gordon was like, was he came over with um, Jamie, who I forget his last name, it was the two Jamies from Lab Bar in London with Doug Ankara, who's an African American, mm -hmm. or I mean, not an African American, he lives in London, so whatever. Uh, he's an English African or whatever the politically correct term is to talk about black people in London. Uh, but it's just, it's been a hundred years since an African American has really written a major, like I, th I think mm -hmm. Greg Bohm mentioned that there might have been some like pool bar book in the 80s written by an African American black bartender in America. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that might be the book. I mean, I feel like we, women and, and mm -hmm. people of color have largely been left out of mm -hmm. this uh, book topics right. so I feel like hopefully Shannon has mm -hmm. will be, be the beginning of that change right Noah well I mean I, I think it's really I mean we're talking about like really a snapshot of what we're drinking today mm -hmm. I'm not and, well, not not just what we're drinking but of the of right but, our, but, but this thing but, we do but it's funny because so many of the books that we talk about on mm -hmm. our list I think was so much more representative mm -hmm. of what America mm -hmm. as as a whole mm -hmm. was drinking at the time where mm -hmm. 
a lot of what we still talk about is obviously, I think the cocktail revolution we've won, mm -hmm. but I think still a lot of the books that we write about, like, don't reflect what everybody's drinking mm. in America, right. right? Sure, yeah. So, like, you know, the, like, you know, Tequila Mockingbird mm. is probably more representative of 2019 yeah. in 100 years than, you know, mm. most of our books are. Which goes back <laughs> to, like, you just wrote, wrote the, the cover history. copy for oh, yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's, I it's, mean, uh, if I was going to, you know, I, I don't know, it's a good question. I mean, right. I, you know, and, and so much of our focus has been backwards. Right. Like very, you know, I think we've finally gotten to a point where, you know, there's still a lot to mine mm -hmm. looking back, you know, and there are plenty of books still to be written. And I mean, I think we've really just scratched the surface in terms of the stories right. you know, that can be written. I think what we do at Half Full and you do it in Vibe show that, mm -hmm. you know, there's still so many wonderful stories and amazing tales and characters mm -hmm. to be told. I hear there's this but, Oxford Companion. <laughs> I, I mean, the Oxford Companion that Dave is editing, I'm, a, I'm an associate of her. If we ever finish it, will be like, uh, it will, can, it will, everything in the world will be contained in that book, I think. <laughs> it's the only book you'll ever need. It has, uh, for anything, exactly. It'll be the only book any of us want to do with anymore. Auto care, <laughs> uh, gardening. Um, <laughs> Food, uh, camping, survival techniques. I mean, literally, just buy this book. You never have to buy another book in the world. Um, We're to keep warm. Exactly. For but if Jim's parents yeah, need to I mean, exactly. warm, yeah. you know. Yeah. If, if, we, if we had finished it on time, I would definitely say it was the Oxford yeah. Companion Spirits of Cocktails. But in, in Bookstock 3, we can say. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. It might be the Louisville Tech Spirits. <laughs> <laughs> Companion to Spirits of Cocktails. Exactly. Exactly. All right. We, we've gone a little bit long, but I hope that's okay. But I would love to get a, any questions from, from you guys. Yes, Joe. Oh, God. <laughs> the ideal bartender. I mean, I... Uh, I mean, it's an interesting... I mean, it's a... I mean, that... Uh, For me, it was a... My sort of... Excuse me. Oh. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> we gotta go now. I'm like, we don't want to answer. Gotta go. Gotta go. That's amazing. <laughs> Next question. All right. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, for no. me, um, the I when I when I started thinking about my books, I um, was focusing on genres or sort of types of books. Mm -hmm. And Tom's book, I think that if I were to choose a book of that time period, I'd probably pick Enslin's book, Recipes for Mixed Drinks, which was published at a very similar time. It's like right before Prohibition and. That book is mostly a collection of recipes, and it and I feel like the major. I feel like the there are there are subgenres within all cocktail books, and I think bartender recipe book would be the like place where I would put the bucket that I would put Tom Bullock's book, and I feel like that for me that book that bucket was started by Jerry Thomas, which is why I put that book as and I focused when I did this. Mostly on firsts. I, I mean, to be honest, like, you know, that that's one that was right on the bubble for me. So, you know, the books that I, if this was, if we, Jim and I, said the top 15 books or the top 11 books, I think that one would have been on it. Um, I think Wayne Curtis's book, you know, and the, and the Bottle of Rum would be, you know, one, two. I mean, it's a very hard, there's so many good books. You know, Jim mm -hmm. and I have, way more than 10 books at our house mm. um, between us. No, um, mm. individual. I mean, like, literally, I mean, you know, we both, I mean, there's so many books that we love and are important that these lists are terrible in that way. And I, and, well, and I, I also think, think that you have to, the greatest part about that question is it's important to whom. And I think right. that that book, it actually, if this was a book of the books that I most want to own, the ideal bartender would be number one because it's the only cocktail book that I want that I don't own. So I feel like with respect to like what I was, the list that I ended up choosing was mostly I think books that were like trailblazing um, in the category and that I think that kind of created a, a seismic shift in the way that, that I imagine bartender authors thought about uh, writing a cocktail book in particular. And I feel like while it was incredibly significant that he was the first African-American to write one of these books, 
the content of his book did not change, it was not archetypal or in my opinion did not change the genre in significant ways, personally, in and, my opinion. And I would say that like, I mean the most amazing thing about the time, or one of the most amazing things now, is that a lot of these books that like we'd only heard of or seen reference to are now again available. So, you know, Bullock's book is in print again, you know, through Cocktail Kingdom. And there are a lot of reprints, you know, every, you know, Alfred Barnard, I was looking for doing research on this and I found somebody with a new reprint of a Barnard book that I'd never even heard of before mm -hmm. about like his visits to other distilleries that I was like, what is this? You know, like, so, I mean, there's constantly stuff that we're finding and, and that's coming to light and being published. And I think part of it is also uh, the amazing thing is how people read them and are inspired by them and, you know, you know, do other things after reading them. So, right. I mean, I hope, you know, if, if we did this in two years, the list could be very different given. Are you feel yeah. string right now, Noah? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Other questions? Yeah, Maggie. So being totally outside this world, um, as, a, as a distiller of rum, as someone who does not write or <laughs> as someone who does not make cocktails or write about them at all, um, obviously, you know, the writing community's been smaller and it's growing really fast. Mm -hmm. And when one musician samples another musician's work and then profits off that, they pay that musician. How do you see the future of using other people's recipes in people's books? going forward when people aren't close friends and super excited to do that? Do you think that'll change? Do you think it won't change? Like if someone's using other people's recipes in their book, they publish that book mm -hmm. and they profit, will they be paying for I people's think, recipe mean, rights? I, I, I don't know. I That's mean, why I'm asking. I think Co sort of solved that problem. I mean, technically, I think they own all the recipes because it's work for hire, but they did pay all the bartenders a fee who were featured in their book for their recipes, which... I think is the right way to do it. I, I don't. I don't think it's. It's usually not that big of a problem. I mean, is, is, is that what you're asking, or are you asking? I, I'm saying like going. I think that's great. I didn't know that. Yeah. Thank you for answering my question. But moving forward, I think like we say, oh, it's not a big problem now. No mm. one really cares. We're all friends. But it's getting bigger and We're bigger like, and bigger. Like, you know, my recipe shows up like I create a recipe and suddenly shows up in a bar and like. You know, Edinburgh or something. In someone's published book, I would or, say. Right. I mean, I think that for me, as someone who actually creates mm -hmm. recipes and people buy them or who gets paid mm -hmm. to create recipes, I, in my opinion, and I do not speak for all the bartenders or people who create recipes, I feel like copywriting recipes is the road to hell in a handbasket. Mm -hmm. And I personally feel like a recipe is a template with which people can improvise upon. It is literally jazz. And for instance, the recipes that I created 10 <laughs> years ago, I'll, I oftentimes will use a different, you know, vermouth or liqueur or whiskey or gin or whatever it is because the, the options out there 10 years ago are not the same. Or for instance, our, our individual palettes change and the collective palettes of what's popular in the world changes. So there's always every act of making a drink for someone is an act of interpretation yeah. and an act of customization right. and and i so i just I'm, get the sense that like for me but, like, but, the, but, the, right. but to be honest like the the whole idea of intellectual property in art i mean if only we had an attorney present oh man, like, who, who like could say something who did, about like, this. trademarking <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh yeah man, exactly um, <laughs> i mean phil did i mean you i asked you to write a story about this for half full and it took <laughs> phil like you kept being like no, no, I don't, okay, I think I have it. No, no, like, no, I got well, it. And, and the, the difference between the, the musical example, you can copyright music. You can't copyright recipes. You can get a trademark on the name, and that's where Painkiller and Dark and Stormy and all the Bacardi cocktail, um, but a recipe is, is, is a collection of facts, and you can't tra uh, copyright facts. So, but if you, like you said, work for hire, if, if I hire, a bartender to create a beverage program for me, um, you can assert ownership of that in a limited extent. But again, once, and you can also assert trade, uh, trade secrets. So a lot of the tiki, you know, you can talk about this, a lot of the tiki drinks were made behind closed doors <coughs> with, with a bottle that said Don's Mix Number no. 3 or something like that. That's a trade secret. So that's like Coca-Cola, Colonel Sanders, a secret blend of 11 herbs and spices, that sort of thing. 
But again, uh, recipes generally aren't protectable. Drink names are, but not the recipes. I like what you said about death info, because it is, it's sort of like, imagine you're putting together a book, tropical drinks of the 2000s, and you say, this is this person's recipe, right. and you republish it as your, yeah, attribution, but like, are we taking more? I mean, I just think no. I mean, I th you look at drink like the last word, the last word was popularized mm. by Murray Stenson. It's a mm. recipe that, that I make because of Murray, not because mm. of because it Bottoms Up or mm. because of the Detroit Athletic Club or whatever. Mm. So I just think that I, it's, in my opinion, like if we, I find as someone who writes these books, if we get to a point where someone wants to interview a bartender and include a recipe and they're like, well, you're gonna have to pay me. Mm. Like I just feel like, like yeah. knowledge, I think we should be moving towards an open source platform with respect to recipes and, and, and the ways we do things to improve the craft, as opposed to being like, no, pay me. Like, I, well, I just I feel mean, like it's not, and I think there are if, other like ways, I, and I feel like when people, when I go to a bar and I see one of my recipes on the menu, I don't feel exploited, I feel like sweet. Like my, my work is getting out there. <laughs> well, yeah. as long as I think that it, the, the person and the bar is credited, I mean, I like for my but book. Sometimes like, they don't make it right, so I'm like, I'm yeah. glad my name's not on it. In fact, most of the time. <laughs> but it's cool that they're trying. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I don't even, I'm, I'm, next yeah, question. Right. <laughs> okay. Let's do one more question and then you can come pester him afterwards. Do we have one more? Yeah, over here. Sure. Um, this one's for Jim. Thank God. Um, <laughs> no, we'll answer it anyway. <laughs> um, is there a, something, a topic in cocktail books or um, the canon of cocktail literature right now that for new bartenders you think has not been covered? Um, because there is a huge mass of cocktail books out there and, you know, you can walk into a Barnes and Noble and see, you know, a mass of them on the shelves. And honestly, I guess this is for you too, but I'm in particular the, from the perspective of a new bartender, do you think if there's anything that hasn't been covered properly? Um, if only there was a cocktail book for the first modern speakeasy in New York. <laughs> um, I feel like the... You mean for today's new bartender or for like new bartenders for, for all time? I like today's new bartenders. Well, one of the things I tried to cover in my new book in the last chapter, it called it Beyond the Bar, and it was like this thing about being a professional bartender in the 21st century. And I think that in the same way that I think that like I remember reading, which a, a book that could be on a, a top you know 10 list, like Toby Cicchini's book Cosmopolitan, I think Cosmopolitan, his biography of being a bartender in the late 90s in New York was sort of like the kitchen confidential, I imagine. Like, That's why oh, it was bought. Or like That's white food. heat for yeah. like a lot of chefs read Kitchen Confidential or cooks read Kitchen Confidential or white heat and like decided they wanted to be a cook. And I was already a bartender when Cosmopolitan came out. But I think in the way that like Toby kind of both glamorized, but also talked about the, the trials and tribulations of a bartender mm -hmm. were particularly like, it made you want to, it made you think bartending was cool. And in the same way bars. that like the movie, if you were like a bartender of the 90s, like you saw before Tom Cruise was jumping around on couches, like he was more <laughs> famous for like Maverick and Top Gun and, and the movie Cocktail. And I think that like you, you actually, many of us thought that movie was cool. And so I, I just think that, okay. For young bartenders, what's missing now is in the post-craft cocktail world, what is the book that is like probably more of a narrative written by an authority figure who's a colorful writer, but like what is the book that, that brings talented people out, like makes them stop working at their insurance agency and makes them want to be a bartender? And I think that we in this business are only as good as the people who we work with. And I would just say that like, the books that entice people whose, whose parents love them and who went to school and who like, are really talented people to want to be bartenders only, I think, enriches the industry. You know? So I would say that the one book that sort of I'll, I would be looking for to be written in the next few years is the sort of 21st century you know, cocktail or, or mm. kind of kitchen confidential for like that, that isn't, 
that doesn't feel like a Civil War reenactment. Right. That's like sort of like, <laughs> that's actually like, it's cool. Right, right. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank um, you. Once again, we've got one more of these coming up here in a little bit. Uh, in the meantime, there are books back there. Buy them, have them signed, grab a drink, do something. Thank you. Do something, would you?